Today's video is proudly sponsored by Linode. Linode has been doing cloud computing since 2003, which is actually before Amazon Web Services was even a thing. On Linode's platform, you can get your server up and running in minutes. And they include all the popular distributions, such as Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and get this, even Arch Linux. And let's be honest, what could be better than a Linux-focused cloud server provider that lets you tell all of your friends, I run Arch? Linode has multiple server plans available to make any app scalable and flexible. You could use it to host a blog, a VPN server, a Minecraft server, and much more. In fact, Linode is the platform of choice to host the entire web presence of Learn Linux TV. In addition, Linode offers 24 by 7 365 support, regardless of plan size, so you can get help from a live person when you need it. New users can get started right now with $100 towards your new account, and I highly recommend you check them out because Linode is awesome. And now, let's get started with today's video. Hello and welcome back to my Proxmox course. Here in class number five, we'll be creating our first virtual machine. And I'm really excited for this because starting now, everything that we go over is going to build on the last thing that we went over. So it's going to be a lot more fun going forward. So let's dive into the process of creating our first virtual machine. So like I mentioned in the intro, in this particular class, what we're going to be doing is walking through the process of creating a virtual machine. And before we do that, we really should take a look at our resources and just make sure that we have enough memory available in order to create a virtual machine. So as you can see, I have quite a bit of memory free. I don't think I'm going to run out anytime soon. On your end, unless you are working ahead, you probably don't have any virtual machines either. So unless you have a host that has very little in the way of RAM, you actually should have no problem creating a virtual machine. Then again, some of my audience you guys are using things like Intel Nux, and some of those, well, they don't have as much RAM as others. So you might be a little starved for memory, and in that case, if you are, a container, like I mentioned in the previous episode, probably makes more sense. But anyway, on my end, I'm good. I have plenty of memory free, plenty of CPU free. I can go ahead and continue. If yours is actually trending to be very high in RAM and or CPU, well, you might want to find out why before you continue. Anyway, what I'm going to do is click Create VM, like you see right here. And now let's walk through the process. So the first thing we're going to do is select a node. It's automatically selected node one for me. And that makes sense considering I haven't even added a second node yet. I don't have a cluster, so I only have this one node. As you would expect, when I drop it down, we only see that one node. Now right here we have the ID, and that's very, very important. Each resource needs its own ID. And by resource, I mean containers and virtual machines. And the thing to keep in mind here is that the ID always needs to be unique. So if I assign this virtual machine an ID of 100, then that means that I'm not able to use 100 for the ID anywhere else. I can't have another virtual machine in that case with an ID of 100 if I've already used it. And that also means that I can't have a container with an ID of 100 either. Again, it has to be unique. 100 is okay, I'll leave it up to you, but I'm always a fan of setting up some kind of a scheme here. So for example, I might have 100 to 200 being reserved for containers, maybe 300 to 400 is for virtual machines. I might even have a different grouping for templates and things like that as well. Of course, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just letting you know that it's something that you might want to consider. But if you don't have a preference, what it's going to do is select the next available ID number starting at 100, like you see here. And when I create another virtual machine, it's going to create it with an ID of 101. Of course, I could actually just go here and change that to whatever I want it to be. I'm going to leave it at 100 though, to keep it simple. Just keep in mind that you do have full control over what number you want assigned as far as ID to each virtual machine and container. I recommend that you give it a name. If you already have a host name picked out, I recommend that you use that. So you could have something like web server, for example. In fact, I'm going to leave it on that. 
I just recommend that you give it a name that helps you identify what it actually is. So you can name it after its purpose or its host name if you have one, domain name if you have one. I'll leave it up to you. So we give it a descriptive name and then we drop down where it shows resource pool. We don't actually have one yet. We'll go over that later. But if you did have resource pool set up, then you select the one that matches the use case for that particular virtual machine. Again, we'll cover that later. Next, what we're going to do is go to OS. We can also click next or back down here as well if we want to. What we need to do is actually give it an ISO image. And that's important because we need to have installation media for the virtual machine. So even if you're setting up Windows or Linux, whatever it is, you have to have an ISO image for that operating system. Now, I don't have any ISO images currently. Under storage, it defaults to local. But I don't actually have anything other than local here. So in that case, we can't actually continue because we have no ISO image. So what I'm going to do is add an ISO image, and then I'll come back to this. So I'm going to X out right here. So I'm going to drop this down. I'm going to click on local right here. And as you can see, we have a section for ISO images. Now what's really cool is we can click this button here to download from a URL. We can also upload an ISO image as well if we already have it downloaded. So what I'm going to do is just download Ubuntu Server. So I'll go to ubuntu.com. Then up here, I'll select Download. I'll choose Ubuntu Server. And then Manual. And what I'm going to do is download Ubuntu Server 2004.2 LTS. Now, of course, Debian works as well, but Ubuntu Server is pretty cool, so I'm going to go with that. It's probably a good idea to have a mix of distributions on your Proxmox host. That just gives you more exposure to other operating systems and platforms. But to keep it simple, I'm just going to stick to this. And what I'm going to do is actually cancel it. And right here, it's telling me if your download doesn't start automatically, you can click on this button to kick off the download. But what I'm going to do instead is right click on it. I'm going to copy the link. And then I'm going to go over here to Proxmox and click download from URL. As you could probably guess, I'm going to paste the URL right here. And if all goes well, this should actually download the Ubuntu server ISO image. So I'll click query URL. And that's going to automatically determine the file name. It's basically just the end of the path anyway. And I'll just click download. We'll keep it simple. And now it's downloading the ISO image straight to Proxmox. That's pretty cool. In the past, before version 7.0, we used to have to download it and then upload it. So there was like two steps for one task. Now we just paste the URL in here and it does the rest for us. And here it says task OK. And as you can see, we have the ISO image listed right here. So I can go back to create VM. And again, we were going to call this web server. And now we have the ISO image listed here. Previously, we didn't even have an ISO image at all. And that makes it really easy. So I'm going to click on that. And then here we have the type of guest OS that we will be running. Now you want to make sure that you select the correct thing here. It's really important because Proxmox might be adjusting things behind the scenes to, you know, to facilitate the operating system that you intend to be running. So if you choose the wrong thing here, it's not going to really know how to deal with that. So we want to make sure that we're honest. If I drop this down. We have other options. So we have Linux, of course. We have Windows and we have other. Under version, we could choose the version. I click on other, then we can choose whatever we want, but we don't really have any selections for that. I'm just going to leave it on Linux because Ubuntu server is a Linux distribution, so that's appropriate. I'll click next. And then here we have some additional options for the system that we want to take a look at. For example, the SCSI controller, if I drop that down, we have a number of different options. Now I'm going to leave it on as default. That should be good enough for now. And then for the graphics card, I'm going to leave that on the default as well, but we have other options here. 
It's not very common that any use case will require you to change this so it's beyond the scope. Just know that it is a possibility to configure that if you do find yourself in a situation where that makes sense. So let's go next. Now here we have some options that are specific to the virtual hard disk. One thing that I definitely want to point out first is that Proxmox has support for discard. That's really important for SSDs. If your server storage is actually using an SSD, then you're probably going to want to enable this. And since mine is using SSD, then I will enable that. It's just a good idea to implement trim support, which is what this does, on your guest operating systems, because that definitely helps optimize the storage, which is something you'll definitely want to do if you can. If you're using a spinning Rust hard drive, you won't want to check this box right here. And even if you do have an SSD, if the operating system you are running in your VM, if that doesn't support discard, then you won't want to enable this. Recent versions of Linux and Windows should have no problem. You'll definitely want to turn this on if the host server has SSD itself. So we have several options here. We're going to leave this alone. But if you did have any particular reason to change the order of hard drives on the bus for the VM, you can do that here. And here's defaulting to local LVM for the storage, which is actually correct. We don't have any other option anyway. But in the future, if you do implement something like shared storage or another hard disk, then you'll be able to choose the storage pool that you want to use right here. I'm going to leave that alone. And for the size, I'm going to change that to 16. I think 32 is a bit overkill. I'll leave that up to you. Basically, you want to size the Gibby bytes to however many you think you might need. The more data that you plan on storing on your server determines how much storage you actually want to allocate for it. I'll leave that up to you. Let's continue. CPU. Now, depending on how many cores your physical host server has, that's going to determine how many cores you want to provide your VM right here. The more cores you have, the better. But the way I would look at it is if your server isn't really going to be doing all that much, maybe it's just not going to be seeing that much usage, then there's probably no reason to give it two cores. Now, if you're running something like Nextcloud or something that's going to get some serious usage, you might want to crank that up. But for right now, I'm going to leave that on one. My general rule of thumb for this is that you should probably always use one and only increase it if the application that you're running is showing signs of being starved for CPU attention. So if the CPU on the VM is running at 100% all the time, then that might be grounds for increasing the number of cores. I'll leave that up to you. When in doubt, start at one. If things are running slow or the system requirements for the application you wanna run imply that you'll need more, go ahead and adjust it accordingly. When it comes to memory, I'm going to leave it at two gigabytes. Generally, I don't recommend less than one, which would be exactly half of this, but I have plenty of memory on my server as you just saw, so two gigabytes, that's not really going to hurt me any. I think one is probably a safe minimum for most people. 512 megabytes is probably even better because that'll stretch it a little bit further, but unfortunately, I don't really know what kind of hardware you have or whether or not that's possible, and some operating systems actually require more than that just for the installation alone, so your results might vary. If you do set this to a lower number and the operating system installation process crashes, more often than not, it's because you set this too low. Anyway, I'll continue. Now here, I want you to pay special attention to this, even though we're not actually going to be straying from the defaults this time. In the future, it's a good idea to separate the management interface and the VM network. Now we can't do that because we only have this interface right here, VMBR0, or VM Bridge 0 And that's okay, that's all we need right now. In the future, I do recommend that you set up an additional network, we'll get to that later, but for right now, I'll leave that alone. So that's what I want you to keep in mind, that it's a good idea to separate the management network and the VM network, which we'll do later. So I'll click Next, and then it's given us a summary. So I could actually start the VM right here if I'd like to, which I'm not going to do. I'll just click finish for now. Now we can see 100 right here, which is the ID, and then the name was just added here. So the VM is created. It's not running though. But before we run it, let's just have a look at the options. So if I click on it and then I go down here to options, 
I'm not going to go over all of these options right here, but there's a few that you definitely want to keep in mind. Start at boot is especially important. If you reboot your server and this is set to no, then this virtual machine will not automatically start. In that case, you'll need to log into your Proxmox interface and then start it manually. Most of the time, especially for production VMs, you will want them to automatically start. And since this is highlighted, I can click on edit. I can check this box right here and click OK. We also have a start and shut down order. And that's helpful if you need to make sure a particular VM is started before another one. You can configure that here. A good example of that is if you have a database server and you have other VMs that rely on that database server, then you certainly won't want those VMs to start before the database server does. You're going to want to make sure that the database server starts first. So if I edit this, we can essentially give it a number of priority. I'm not going to do that right now because, well, we only have this one VM anyway. But just keep in mind that you can determine the order that the VMs start in, and you might want to do that. Now the guest agent right here, that's disabled. That's okay. But we will want to turn that on later. But right now, let's go ahead and start up the server. So we have the server right here. I'm going to click on console. And it's telling me that it failed to connect to the server. And something that I really don't like about Proxmox is when you do get this message, it logs it right here. Honestly, I kind of think that's a waste. I mean, I know that the console here is going to fail if the machine is not started. I just clicked on it because I want to see it as soon as it does start. So personally, I don't really consider that an error. And sometimes a section down here can be full of errors like that. I'm going to ignore it. And we have the console here, so let's start it up. We have a power button right here. I'll click on it. And then I'll click on start. Do you really want to start the VM? Yes, in fact, I do. Now it's booting up. We see the BIOS screen here. And this icon should change here shortly. And there it is. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay in the icon updating right here. You can see that the icon is now lit up. It's not dark and gray like it was. It's black, it's obvious, and we have the green play button next to it. So what you see right here is the VM is actually starting. It's the same thing that you would see if you were starting up a physical server with Ubuntu server because it pretends to be a physical server. So we're going to give this a moment to start up and I'll go through the installation process of Ubuntu. Should be ready to go here shortly. And here we are. So the installation process for Ubuntu server is pretty straightforward. Right now, it's asking me what my primary language is. I'll press Enter. And now it's giving us a chance to select a different keyboard layout. If our keyboard layout is something other than English US, I'll leave that up to you. You can just hit the up and down arrows here to select something and press Enter on something to change it. But that's correct in my case, so I'll just press Enter on Done. If you have more than one Ethernet adapter on your virtual machine, you can select the Ethernet adapter here. I only have one anyway, so I'll just press Enter. There's no proxy in my case. If your connection does have a proxy, you can enter that here. Probably unlikely, but maybe some of you will have one. For the mirror, the default is usually a good choice here. It's where Ubuntu will download updates and new packages from. This default mirror is adequate. I'll press Enter. And right here, it's asking us if we want to use the entire hard disk. I have an entire book on Ubuntu server if you want to know more about the specifics here. But as far as this video is concerned, we don't really need to go any deeper than just choosing the default. So I'll just press Enter on Done. Enter again to confirm the changes that we want to make. Are you sure that you want to continue? I do. That's going to wipe out the virtual disk, which is okay because it's a brand new virtual disk anyway. I'll press Enter. And now I'm going to fill in my user info. I'll keep it simple. And enter again. I do recommend that you install OpenSSH. That helps you remotely manage your server, which is always good. So I press the space bar to check that box. And then I'll go down to Done. I'll press Enter. There's additional packages that we can install into Ubuntu server if we'd like. I'm going to skip all of these. I just press Tab to immediately go down here to Done. I'll press Enter. And now it's installing. So I'm going to give this a few minutes to finish installing, and then I'll be right back. 
All right, so the installation at this point is all done. So I'll press tab and then down, go down here to reboot now. I'll press enter. And this error message right here has nothing to do with Proxmox itself. It's just trying to unmount the virtual CD-ROM drive. It's okay, I'll just press enter. And there you go. So as you can see, the web server right here, as I chose to call it, is booting up. And the first boot of an Ubuntu server instance is going to take longer than subsequent boots going forward. And as you just saw, the login screen was visible, but it didn't really give me a chance to log in as of yet, because there's some additional configuration that Ubuntu server does before it's fully ready. What we're seeing in particular right now is Cloudinit is doing its thing, and I'll talk about Cloudinit later on in the series. But anyway, the process should be complete because the last thing it does, if I remember correctly, is the SSH host key fingerprints, which has been done. So what I can do is just press enter. You can see the login prompt down there. I know the text is fairly small, but all I'm doing is just typing in my username and then the password, the same username and password that we set up during the installation process of Ubuntu server. I'll press enter. Preferably, I should type the password correctly. And there we go. So now we have the web server instance. So to make things easier to see, what I'm going to do is switch over to a terminal, which I just so happen to have open already, down here on this workspace. So I'm going to SSH into that particular node. So it's just SSH and then the username that we chose during installation, at, and then the IP address. And that's the IP address that it was given by DHCP on my network. I'll press enter. I'll type yes. I'll type in the password. And we are now connected to the web server instance via SSH. And it is running in Proxmox. And we could tell that because we should have a KVM CPU like we see here. So this is definitely running inside our Proxmox server. That's pretty cool. The next thing that I recommend you do with every instance of Ubuntu server is update it. And I have entire videos about this subject right here, so I'll spare you the details, but essentially all we're doing is just refreshing the index and then installing updates. So I'm running sudo apt update. And the double ampersand allows me to chain two commands together, one after another. And then the next command is sudo apt dist upgrade. We have quite a few updates, as you can see, that can be installed. It's just a good idea to start from a freshly updated state. So I'll press enter. I'll let these install, and then I'll be right back. All right, so that's done. And next, what I suggest you do is install the QEMU guest agent for your distribution. I'm going to show you the process right here in Ubuntu. If you're using a different distribution, then you'll have to look at the instructions for that distribution to load the agent. But for us here on Ubuntu, it's really easy. So what I'm going to do is run sudo apt install. And the package name is QEMU hyphen guest hyphen agent, just like that. So I'll press enter. This should go by pretty quickly. And it's already done. And now let's check the status of that particular service and see if it's running. And it's not actually running. That's a problem. So what we actually need to do is start it up. I will need sudo for that. And I changed the status keyword to start. So we're going to start the service. And as you can see here, it's taking a little bit of time to start up. That's okay. Because actually, here in the options, we have the guest agent disabled. You can see that right here. So we need to enable that. I'm going to check this box here and click OK. Now anytime a setting turns red when you change it, what that means is that change will not take effect until the VM is restarted. 
And that's okay. Let's go back here to the terminal. We can see that the start of the agent did fail. That's all right. Again, we just enabled that option in Proxmox, so that's to be expected. What I'm going to do is run sudo and then power off. That should power off the VM. I'll press enter. And then as you can see, it's shut down. I go back here to options. You can see that the enabled is still a different color. It looks red to me, but the colors could be off on my display. Anyway, what I'm going to do is right click and start the VM. We can see that it's starting up. And there's no red or orange text here. It's actually enabled. The server is ready to go. So what I'm going to do is connect back to the server. And now I'm connected to the server. Now let's check the status of the QEMU guest agent service. We can see that it's running. If for some reason it wasn't running, then you could change the status keyword to start, add sudo to the front of the command, and that should start that process. I don't need to do that, obviously, because it is running. So let's have a bit of fun. What I'm going to do is run sudo apt and then install. And the package that I'm going to install is the Apache 2 package. And Apache is a web server, if you didn't already know. This is a web server instance, or at least that's what the name says. So that makes sense. I'll just press enter. It's a good example of nothing else. And I'm just installing the package. It's going to go by really quick. And it's already done. So back up here. We have the VM running. And I have the IP address committed to memory. I don't know why. I'm just going to type the IP address right here of the VM. It was 172.16.249.249, at least in my case. And right here we see the default sample web page for Apache. So not only is the VM working, we're also able to access an application running inside the VM as well. And that means we're in really good shape. So now you have your own virtual machine. That's pretty cool. I'm sure you're itching to create a bunch of virtual machines, your own fleet of VMs, if you will, but not so fast. In the next video, I'll be showing you how to create a template of that virtual machine, which is going to save you a lot of time when it comes to provisioning and launching additional virtual machines in the future. So I'll meet you over there as soon as that video is uploaded, if it hasn't been already. Thanks for watching, and make sure you click that like button if you're enjoying this series so far. And also subscribe if you haven't already, because you'll be the first to know as soon as I have a new episode in this series uploaded on my channel. And I have some awesome things coming, so stay tuned.